Hello friends, welcome to Equip Kingdom. This is where we come together every week to dig deep into God's word, to learn about who he is, who we are in Christ Jesus, and how we live in his kingdom. Thank you for joining me today. We're actually finishing up with the second half of Luke 10 today, looking at verses 25 to 42. Um, and, and today what we're doing is we're looking how Luke continues to present discipleship as a way of life in today's verses, showing that through two different stories that happened during his journey to Jerusalem, what it means to love others and to love Jesus. You're also gonna see that both of these stories are, are connected by themes of doing and receiving. Now, I want to start our time together by praying for you. So let's go ahead and bow our, our heads and, and worship God. And God, I pray that every breath that we take, that it bear witness to your brilliant design and your loving kindness. You alone, God, make all things new and use every situation, no matter how tough, to bring good into the lives of your beloved children in Jesus. We are so thankful that nothing can separate us from your love. And we are thankful that all that you do, that in all your ways, that you delight to reveal your love for us. God, I pray that you help us to know the difference between our rules and your will for us. Help us to see everyone as created in your image, Father God, as worthy of our mercy and our compassion. Show us that loving others is not contingent on how we feel about them and that we don't have to agree with their ways to, to, to reveal your goodness to them. I pray that you soften our hearts wherever our prejudice create stumbling blocks for your will to be done through us. God, we want to represent you so much more than we want to represent the world. Uh, please help us, Lord. Please help us to repent from looking like the world. God, we also ask for your guidance in knowing when it's time to act and when it's time to listen, right? We listen to your Holy Spirit and then we move. Teach us to understand our own hearts, Lord, so that we might do everything for your glory and out of love and adoration for you rather than for seeking approval from others. It's not about us, Lord. It's for us, but not about us. Yes, your ways, Lord, they, they bring life and they multiply blessings and we only want to do what you have planned for us. I pray as always that you bless the hearing and the reading of this word, that we may receive revelation of your good, perfect and pleasing will and divine purpose for us in this season. Help us to release our circumstances in our lives in complete trust of your goodness and faithfulness. God, I also pray that you see our time uh, meditating on your word as an offering of worship because we want to know you and we want to tell others about you. We lift you up. We lift up your holy name in the mighty and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I mentioned at the start of the video that Jesus has been teaching his followers how to be his disciples. To this point, Jesus has revealed his expectations for how his disciples are supposed to treat their enemies and one another. Jesus has expressed how his disciples must live like him, which means denying themselves and taking up their crosses. Jesus has taught his disciples about the nature of their mission. And Jesus has stressed how his disciples cannot be distracted or delayed from their commitment to following him. Because disciples are, are more than representatives of Jesus. They are, in fact, um, the face, word, and deed of Jesus. And, and what it does is it expands his ministry beyond his physical presence. And to that end, Jesus empowers his disciples with his spirit so that they might go before him and proclaim and provide evidence that the kingdom of God has come. Now, we ended last week's study with Jesus revealing the unique relationship that he has with the Father. And their relationship is characterized by complete unity and trust, and their relationship facilitates shared power that is rooted in love, and that love is literally bringing salvation to humanity. Through Jesus, his disciples also share in this same power and authority, and they use both, both his power and his authority, to demonstrate the love of God and his heart for saving his creation. And that's where we are with today's verses, how a disciple demonstrates their faith in Jesus through loving others 
and loving Jesus. And as you might guess, we're going to actually start chapter 11 next time with Jesus teaching his disciples about demonstrating love to the Father. Let's go ahead and look at the first of the stories that we're studying today, which is Luke 10 verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Now, as we've talked about in the past couple of weeks, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem rarely includes the details of when and where these stories happen. And this is one of those stories where we don't have a sense of how much time and distance have passed since the large group of disciples were sent out to proclaim the kingdom. Instead, we're introduced to an unnamed expert in the law who stands before Jesus to ask him about eternal life. Now, Luke uses one of three terms for scribes, lawyer, teacher of the law, and expert in the law. This time, the, the scribe is called an expert in the law. And this may actually mean that this man is distinguished among his peers as one who both knows the law and is authorized by his peers to teach the law. And scribes were, without exception, considered the spiritual leaders of the people. And they were usually, though not always, aligned with the Pharisee faction. Saturday scribes, where they existed, were typically only found in or near Jerusalem. Now, scribes interpreted God's word and declared laws and traditions for the people to follow based on God's word. The more esteemed were called rabbis, and their works were bundled into what is now called the Talmud, which is ongoing commentaries of former scholars' interpretations of the Old Testament, and that was codified into rules and traditions. So when we talk about Jewish law, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about generations of scribe scholarship and applications of the law that the Jewish people were then supposed to follow. By Jesus's time, Jewish law was held in higher authority than God's commandments, mainly since Jewish law was more extensive and detailed. As culture changed, you understand, there, there was more need for more nuance, and that's where Jewish law took over from God's law. And if you've been with us in our studies of Matthew and Mark, you may know that or remember that, that Jesus uh, was highly critical of Jewish law. And um, as we get closer to Jerusalem in our study of Luke, we're going to see more of that same conflict that we've already seen in Matthew and Mark. We're going to see that unfold in Luke's gospel. Now, on one occasion, which is where we are today, this esteemed rabbi is sitting with Jesus, among others. And what I assume is happening is that there's an informal conversation or discussion happening. And at some point, the expert in the law, this esteemed rabbi, he stands up. And we've talked about this many times, that when a teacher began to teach in a formal setting or presented a topic of great importance, the teacher would sit or remain seated and the students would stand up. 
So at first glance, it looks as though the expert in the law is being deferential to Jesus by standing and asking a question of great importance. However, Luke makes it plain to his audience that the expert has an ulterior motivation, that is, to test Jesus. And, and that language that tells me that there's really what's happening here is an honor challenge, which we saw a lot in Matthew, but also in Mark. Now, briefly, honor is the uh, value of a person as seen and expressed in the public spectrum. It was the supreme motivation in the ancient Near East. And, and honor was really seen as a zero-sum game. In other words, as, as one person sought honor, it had to come at the expense of someone else's honor. And to that end, when someone wanted to gain honor at someone else's expense uh, to acquire honor, um, they would have to challenge someone else in a, in a public setting. Uh, the one being challenged would then have to defend their position. The public would then determine who had won the challenge, right? Resulting in the honor for one person and shame or the loss of honor in the other. So the expert in the law is testing Jesus by asking what he, the expert, must do to gain eternal life. And you know, in the face of this, this sounds like the question uh, from the rich young ruler whom we were introduced to in Matthew 19, 16, and also in Mark 10, verse 17. Let's go ahead and look at Mark. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we can see then another instance where Jesus was asked a similar question by different people and also how Jesus restated wisdom as it served his purpose. There wasn't just one person who was asking these questions. He was probably asked over and over again similar questions. So we get to see two nuances of a similar statement. Now the question that the scribe asks, what must he do to inherit eternal life, really tells us a lot about first century Jews and how they saw their relationship with God as transactional. The expert in the law anticipates that there's a, a single action or at least a, a set of predetermined actions that guarantees a spot in God's eternal kingdom, which means that he would forever be dining at the table with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because it is a test, we, we might presume that the, the scribe already has a theoretical answer in mind depending upon which of the two prevailing pharisaical schools he was associated with. And I am assuming for this that he is a, a Pharisee rather than a Sadducee. Now, the school of Shammai uh, taught that at death, the, the soul descended to Sheol, which was the realm of the day, uh, where the soul remained inactive, awaiting the day of judgment. And then on the day of the judgment, God would, uh, would then judge the soul based on whether uh, the person followed God's law. And then he would physically resurrect that person to either uh, Sheol, had they not been um, good and faithful towards God, or whether they went to the Olam Haba, which was the world to come, which is God's kingdom that comes to the Holy Land, the New Jerusalem. For the competing school of Hillel, souls are immediately judged at death and ushered into eternal punishment or eternal reward. Uh, physical resurrection came at the day of judgment, just like it did with Shammai, with only the wicked Gentiles subject to eternal punishment. Hillelites believed that all practicing Jews would be judged as righteous and that only righteous non-Jews, those who had been proselytized into the faith, would join Jews in the kingdom of God on earth, which meant that only those who were born Jewish but who had turned away from the faith would be denied eternal life in God's domain. For the, the scribes of Shammai, then, works play a, a much greater role in determining whether someone spends eternity receiving rewards or punishment. And that really makes me wonder whether this expert in the law is from the stricter school of Shammai. Now, Jesus clearly sees this as a test, and so he responds to the scribe's question with a question about the expert's understanding of God's law, which is what we see in Luke 10, verse 26. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So Jesus asks about God's law and how the expert interprets it. Jesus's counter question rightfully assumes that the expert's knowledge, uh, the expert has knowledge of Mosaic law. And it also informs everyone listening that Jesus considers the key to eternal life in the law. 
Now, some scholars, they see Jesus's tone as sharp and dismissive, but I think that Jesus, knowing the man's thoughts, wants to use everything that the scribe has in mind to teach a greater lesson here. As we see in Luke 10, verse 27, the man has a deep understanding of God's law. He chooses the correct commandments to connect action with salvation. And the one, having responded, said, You shall love the Lord your God from your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole strength and with your whole mind and your neighbor as yourself. So the expert in the law responds with a recitation of what was called at that time the Great Commandment, which was a combination of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. The first part, in conjunction with uh, the additional verses of Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 9, is called the Shema, which means to hear in Hebrew. And the Shema is recited twice a day as a Jewish confession of faith. So faith starts with submitting oneself completely to God, which means heart, soul, strength, and mind. Now, those who are familiar with Deuteronomy 6.5 will note that the expert here includes the mind as an additional separate aspect that needs to be focused on loving God. The Hebrew text only states heart, soul, and strength. And this is most likely Luke's edition following Matthew and Mark's examples when they quote Jesus in a different discussion of the greatest commandment. Because in Greek, like in English, Thoughts are in the mind rather than in the heart, which is what the Hebrew presents. So to cover a person's emotions and thoughts, the synoptic writers added mind. And, and this is my theory, but I think it's pretty well grounded in, in scholarship. Essentially, the command tells us that love for God is demonstrated through our emotion, awareness, power, and intelligence. Now, the second part, which is the second half of Leviticus 19.18, recognizes that devotion to God includes loving those who are made in his image. And we should love God and our neighbor in the same way, with agape, which we know is that Greek word for love that is others-focused and sacrificial in nature. And as far as I know, there's only one time in all of the Gospels where Jesus speaks of love and he doesn't say the word agape. And that's one time with Peter where he's talking about a uh, like a brotherly love. But all the rest of the time when Jesus speaks of love, he's speaking of agape. The expert's answer, connecting love of God and neighbor to eternal life, is correct. The expert had asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life and he correctly understands that God's law is founded on loving him and those made in his, his image. Jesus approves the expert's response with a call to action, which is what we read next in Luke 10, verse 28. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. At its most basic level, Jesus is directing the scribe here to practice what he teaches right? It's not enough to know and recite God's word, which of course the scribe could do very well. He expects believers to apply his word in how they live their lives. Jesus criticizes Pharisees and scribes because of their hypocrisy and failing to correctly apply God's laws to themselves, especially at the deeper level of intent behind the law, namely mercy, love, and justice. Now, you might be able to read into Jesus's words here to suggest that the expert is also guilty of hypocrisy. At the very least, Jesus ties the expert's desire to know what actions he must take to be called righteous before God. He ties this with demonstrating uh, love for God and others. We can definitely learn that God does not consider knowledge of the scriptures alone to be a sufficient expression of love. Now, on another level, I wonder if Jesus is quoting an Old Testament call to action. I want to take you all the way back to Genesis 42, verse 18. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. Now, briefly, Joseph, who is by that time second in command of all Egypt, directs his brothers to leave the second eldest brother behind as a demonstration that they're willing to act sacrificially to save their family. Joseph is testing their hearts to see if they're capable of acting in a loving way. By leaving Simeon behind and going to get Benjamin, as Joseph requests, the brothers respond selflessly, 
which, by the way, is a very definite change from the last time Joseph had interacted with them. Notice also how Joseph adds that he fears God. Now, fear of God means to revere him and to hold him in awe. The Hebrew word for love that is used in the Shema, uh, to love the Lord your God with everything, right? That's not actually applied to God until God himself gives Israel the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. That's the first time that we hear about loving God, right? That's the very first time. Um, I think it's fair to apply here Joseph's fear of God as an earlier statement of love for God. So here, Jesus may be applying that same principle as Joseph by using Joseph's words. Like Joseph, Jesus may be telling the expert that words are cheap, right? Only action is required to, to demonstrate love. And, and I think that Jesus' added directive, it causes tension between him and and the expert, given also that I think that this is an honor challenge to Jesus. Um, I think the expert wants to be seen as right, right? He wants to be seen as righteous before God. He wants to be seen as righteous before others who are present and therefore justified before Jesus, which is what we see when we continue with Luke 10 verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus has challenged the man's expression of love towards God and neighbor by telling him to do it and live. And the expert wants to vindicate himself as someone who practices love of God and neighbor. By asking Jesus to identify who his, nature, who his neighbor excuse me, is, he's also suggesting that there are people who are not his neighbors. The expert wants to limit the exercise of loving others by first identifying who's worthy of love. And so... I think that the expert absolutely has a, a Jewish definition of love uh, when it comes to uh, having a neighbor in mind, right? And we really only need to look at Leviticus 19.17, which is the verse that precedes the command to love one's neighbor. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor, frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. So we see that association in Leviticus 19, where, where immediately God is connecting Israelite to neighbor. And so a Jew's neighbor is first and foremost a fellow Israelite, those who by virtue of birth are, are part of God's covenant promises. And, and taken to a works mentality, neighbors were often limited to those who practiced the law and rabbinical rules and traditions. Because Jewish law stated that, that neighbors were defined as Israelites, including those who lived in the diaspora and other nations, but not non-Israelites, even if they lived in the Holy Land. And although Leviticus 19.17 applies neighbor to a fellow Israelite, there are other scripture and literature from the Second Temple period that also point to Gentiles as neighbors. Um, we have God who tells Israel to treat foreigners who live among the Israelites as native born in Leviticus 19, 33 to 34. And the apocryphal Testament of Issachar includes Gentiles as neighbors. So regardless of how limited he wanted to define neighbor, the expert really only wants to limit his duty to love others only to those who he thinks deserves it. His question in effect is who gets treated as a neighbor? And what Jesus does is he flips the expert's thinking to what it means to be a neighbor. Um, and as Jesus tends to do with those who are outside of his disciples, what does he do? He teaches the expert through a parable. In this case, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which starts in Luke 10, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, Jesus starts off by describing an incident that was really all too common during this time. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was about 17 miles long, and it passed through rocky desert terrain, winding down about 4,000 feet along the Mount of Olives until it stopped at Jericho. Uh, Joshua 18.17 calls this ancient road the Passed Adumim, which Adumim is Hebrew for red, and in this case, the red was a reference to the blood that stained the dusty path because it was dangerous even then, about 1,400 years earlier. Now, bandits during Jesus' time, and, and obviously earlier, were notorious for staking out hiding places among the rocks, 
especially among the numerous caves that were cut out of the mountain and surrounding hills. And you know, Rome tried to deal with this, right? They, they regularly sent soldiers to clear out brigand strongholds in the area, but historical accounts suggest that a lot of these bandits were actually on the priest's payrolls, with priests taking a cut from the bandits in exchange for protection from the authorities. Subsequently, Rome's efforts to make the route safe were, were no doubt hampered uh, by this advance warning to bandits who would merely move their base of operations when the authorities searched the area. And the story's a little unusual because it, it, it would have been unusual for an individual to travel solo along the route because of this known danger. And, and Jesus doesn't say so specifically, but I do believe that we're meant to assume that this man is a Jew. But the victim is not the focus of the story. Um, but if we want to maybe broaden the story's uh, uh, perimeter a bit, we might assume that this man, a Jew, is returning from pilgrimage, having come from uh, Jerusalem, making offerings at the temple. And he has the great misfortune of being jumped by bandits, beaten, stripped, um, and left for near dead, leaving him unable to do anything to help himself. Uh, but... As this was a common, well-traveled route, it, it doesn't take long before others happen by, which is what we read in Luke 10, verses 31 to 32. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So first up is a priest. Um... While the wealthiest and most powerful priests lived in Jerusalem proper, most priests lived within a, a close parameter of Jerusalem, including Jericho, which was a designated priestly city. So this priest could be returning home from service to the temple. Now, the priest would have been seen as a good omen to those listening to the story as one sent by God as one who serves God directly. But what happens is that this priest sees the half-dead man and chooses not to help him. And, you know, we've been looking at Leviticus quite a bit today, right? Um, the book itself is, is actually a manual for the priesthood. Uh, Levites who are descended from Aaron, and Aaron is the brother of Moses. And, and also for the Levites who serve the temple, Levites who don't descend from Aaron. So as an expert in the law recites, or, or cites rather, Leviticus 19.18 as a rule to love one's neighbor, what you have to understand is that rule is primarily directed towards those who serve God and who receive God's share of the tithes and offerings. With that in mind, Leviticus 19.16 actually commands the priest and the Levite who comes after him to help this man. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Now, Jewish law applied Leviticus 19.16 to mean that if a man sees his neighbor drowning, mauled by bleep beasts, um, or attacked by robbers, he is obligated by law to save him. And Jewish law stated that saving a Jew's life superseded all other laws. Jewish law also considered a person who was half dead to be the same as alive. And, and actually, the way that they used it was that um, even though a person was half dead, they were still completely accountable to all their obligations. So... Um, there, there's really no excuse in, in, in the priest not stopping to help this man. But I have seen where, where some suggest that the priest from a distance won't, you know, he's not able to tell if the man is alive and he stays away to protect himself from defilement. And I tell you, I don't think that that's actually um, a good way to look at it because the priest is traveling away from Jerusalem and therefore the temple. And so doesn't need to worry about being defiled before going into the temple. And Jewish law permitted an exception for a corpse that was at risk of being left neglected. Because, you know, we've talked in several studies about how proper burial for a corpse was considered the highest example of piety and charity in Jewish culture. In any case, fear of defilement is not a realistic motivation here. Now, it could also be that Jesus is painting a picture of how people saw priests in first century Israel, because, because generally speaking, they were greatly despised by the common people, and they had reputations for just about every sinful and unacceptable behavior, which I've chosen not to present here today. Um, you know, Jesus doesn't imply that this priest is a sinful man, um, 
and we really don't have any motivation for his refusal to stop and help the injured man. But it is clear that this priest, the one who serves God, does not act according to God's character. And we know God's character. Jesus has already said that God is merciful, and so we should be merciful because the Father is merciful. And then Jesus introduces a second Jewish leader, who's a Levite, who also travels along the route. Now, the Levites, they minister to the temple, uh, very similar in a way to the way the priests ministered to God in the temple. So the the priests were uh, in charge of ministering to God directly, and the Levites were in charge of ministering to the temple. And to that end, they, they guarded the temple gates, um, they cared for the sacred items, they prepared the offerings, they assisted the priests, and, and there was a group of them that were even singers and musicians. As with priests, the Levites were set apart by God to receive his portion given by the other tribes. The other tribes received an inheritance, God is their portion, the Levite's portion, the priest's portion. And, and like the priest in this illustration, the Levite avoids the, the, this wounded man who's, cro and who's, who's over by himself, half dead, um, by crossing to the other side of the road, the Levite. So we have this possible scenario, and it, it's just one of many, where, where we have this priest and the Levite who both may be returning from Jerusalem after having partaken in the offering that was given by this pilgrim who's now lying half dead on the other side of the road. What we do know is that both are seen as being without compassion or mercy, which because they serve God directly, reflects poorly on God, right? I mean, there's no other way to look at that. And that's a point that Jesus is making here. And I think on some level, given what we've already seen in Matthew and Mark, what Jesus is doing is he's presenting a picture of how the temple system has failed to serve the people who may be spiritually dead, or at least half dead, as a consequence. It's a little allegorical, which isn't usually what Jesus does in parables, but I tell you there is an application of that here. But then um, Jesus introduces an unexpected traveler who shows up on the road, which is what we read in Luke 10, verse 33 to 35. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The appearance of a Samaritan, especially in such a helpful way, would have shocked everyone listening. And I think that that shock value is kind of lost on us today. And, and the only way that I can think to compare it to would be like a Palestinian stopping to help a wounded Israeli. I mean, it's not beyond the impossible, but definitely surprising to imagine. I think that's really how shocking that is here. And, you know, we've already talked about the racial animosity between Jews and Samaritans when we studied the 12 disciples who were sent to the Samaritan town to prepare for Jesus' arrival. So I don't want to spend as much time on that here today. Just briefly, um, the enmity between Jews and Samaritans, it really is rooted from the time of Kings when the northern kingdom of Israel was captured and exiled to lands held by the Assyrian Empire, which was starting in the late 8th century BC, like around 70, 722, 721 BC. And what Assyria did was they brought in people from other parts of the empire who then intermarried with the remaining Jews. And, and when these people came in, they brought with them their own pagan religions, which they then combined with the worship of God. You want to read more about this? Uh, go ahead and look at Second Kings 17. It, it tells that whole story. Um, you can also look at Ezra, sort of the after effects, after exile of what that looked like. Now, beyond what happened during the Assyrian Empire, we also have later where Alexander the Great he later resettled Macedonians into Samaria. And after his untimely death, one of Alexander's generals took over the area, founding the Seleucid Empire which can claim the Holy Land, which included Samaria and Israel, as part of the empire. So we have two groups of outsiders who intermarried with Jews, which Jews saw as diluting the bloodline, culture, and faith of Israel. 
and eventually the Samaritans did practice what, what the Jews would have called Judaism. Although like the Sadducees, they only considered the first five books of the Old Testament to be canon. And, and until the time of the Maccabees, they worship God at Mount Gerizim rather than at Jerusalem. And, and around the, the, the end of the, the second century BC, the Maccabees warred against Samaria, destroying Shechem and raising the temple at Mount Gerizim, which was the Samaritan temple, as revenge for Samaria, siding with the Seleucids against the Jews. And, and so really there was no law, love lost there. And, and really it still continued because by Jesus's time, the Samaritans were still considered outsiders, even though they were practicing Jews and they were considered unclean. And it, this is to the point where rabbis considered dining with Samaritans the same as eating pork. So pretty unclean. And, and the historian Josephus reports that, that sometime around 7 AD, I think it's somewhere between 6 and 9 AD, that the temple in Israel was actually shut down, in Jerusalem, excuse me, was shut down at Passover because a group of Samaritans, they infiltrated and desecrated the porticos that led into the inner courts. So they had to shut down the temple in Jerusalem at Passover, which was not a good thing, right? So suffice to say that animosity between Jews and Samaritans was fueled on both sides. Yet here in this story, Jesus with his twists and his stories, right? It's the Samaritan who stops where the man lies helpless and out of the Samaritan's compassion performs this triage to stabilize the wounded man. And so the Samaritan acts like we would expect the priest or the Levite to have acted while the priest and the Levite act and they, they act like the Samaritan should have, they expected how others would have expected the Samaritan to act, right? They're callous, which is what they would have expected from Samaritans. But this Samaritan, he helps without any consideration of the man's neighbor status, and he spends his resources and his time and his money as a servant. He actually serves this helpless man who can do nothing to help himself. And you know, it's not even just about service here, because you might want to also consider that the Samaritan is actually taking a great risk in helping the wounded man, right? They are enemies of Jewish people. And if this man dies, it would have been a very simple matter to accuse the Samaritan of being the one who harmed this man in the first place. Just blame him. What bandits, right? It's the Samaritan who did this. But nonetheless, the Samaritan's not even thinking about that. He acts without regard to his own safety or well-being which, as you know, is what Jesus expects from his disciples as he taught them in Luke 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Fundamentally, this Samaritan shows Jesus' disciples how to deny themselves by serving their enemies. This is what it looks like. Now, uh, Jesus talks about how he, he pours both wine and oil on the man's wounds and, bands, and bandages them. Um, the wine would have served, of course, as a disinfectant for the wounds, while the oil served to soften the wound and soothe as a balm. And I think it's interesting that Luke chooses to, to include this, uh, these details because as a physician, that's what he would have been interested in. Um, but what we have to note is that these are also the Samaritan's provisions that he was going to use on the road, which means that he's also sacrificed his own comfort while he's traveling. Um, I don't know that Jesus necessarily implies this, but I think that in light of the priest and the Levite, we might also see uh, the oil in terms of, of how it was used for anointing and also for offering, right? How an offering to God and how wine was also part of a regular offering to God. Um, we see both actually used in uh, the offering for first fruits to God, which we can read in Leviticus 23 verses 12 and 13. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord, a lamb one year old without defect, together with its grain offering of two tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter of a hin of wine. And I think one of the reasons why this interested me was that, that Jesus is raised to life on the festival of first fruits. So there may be a quiet connection in that as well. 
Well, the Samaritan, he then loads the man onto his mule, which means, of course, he's probably walking, and he detours to the nearest inn. And, and inns were a little different than how we might imagine them today. Because what the Samaritan does is he, he, he goes to a khan, uh, which was also called a caravanserai, which you can see here. Khans were, were open, generally built in a square. The large center courtyard was used by travelers to keep their pack animals or carriages. Um, and you can see uh, there that there are a number of rooms that surround that courtyard. That's where people stayed. They stayed in these rooms, which were generally unfurnished. The early church father, Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin in the fifth century, he traveled to the Holy Land and he located what he believed to be the inn that Jesus is talking about here, which is called the Inn of the Good Samaritan, located on the Mount of Olives, as you can see here. Jerome noted that there was, in fact, a military post located about halfway on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho that would have been ideal for travelers. Archaeologists recently uncovered a second temple village in the area that included a Khan. Um, currently, it's a museum and it is, in fact, called the, the Good Samaritan Inn. So you can visit it today. Now, generally speaking, travelers didn't pay anything to stay in these rooms because there was really nothing in them, but instead only paid for any extras that they might need. And what they would do is, is they would go to someone um, who was usually the proprietor or, or someone who oversaw the inn. And the inns typically had someone um, that they called the warden, uh, who's, who's now translated as the host or the innkeeper. And, and this warden would provide anything that the traveler asked for in return for a fee. And so this is who the Samaritan pays up front the next morning to care for the injured man, a sort of proprietor for hire, right? But it does say here that, that the Samaritan stays with the injured man overnight, caring for him. So he, he may even lose sleep in, in caring for this man who he doesn't know, who we believe would be an enemy should this man not be unconscious, right? Well, then the next morning, this hired caregiver is given two denarii by the Samaritan, which is the equivalent we know of two days wages and really was really enough to buy uh, three weeks of food for one person. Plus, the Samaritan offers, offers the proprietor unlimited recompense for any other expenses incurred. And, and, you know, you can see where the innkeeper could definitely take advantage of the Samaritan's generosity. But you can also tell that that doesn't matter to the Samaritan, given the character that he's demonstrating here. And you know what else we don't see? We don't see any virtue signaling from the Samaritan. There's no attention drawn to his good works, which, of course, reminds me of how Jesus says we're supposed to act um, as disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. So, although that's not, that's not stated here, but just... What we see here with the Samaritan is very much what Jesus prescribes for his dis disciples in Matthew 6. And this is where Jesus ends his story with the Samaritan stating that he will make good on his promise. And so you may remember the experts, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus now turns the challenge back to the expert asking the better question in Luke 10 verses 36 to 37. Which of these three do you suppose became a neighbor of the man who fell among the robbers? So he said, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. For the expert in the law, um, neighbor is a legal term denoting the object to whom he is duty bound to love as he loves himself. It really becomes a matter of who gets help. But for Jesus, Neighbors the subject, the one acting in compassion and mercy towards others in need. Those who love others as they love themselves become neighborly, unconditional of who receives the benefit, friend or enemy, Jew or Gentile, deserving or not. Did you notice that the expert in the law, he can't even bring himself to, to name the Samaritan. He's the one who showed mercy. So, the expert sees the point of the parable, but his reluctance also shows that he has a way to go in loving without prejudice. He wanted to justify himself, and now he's uncomfortable with the cost of gaining eternal life because it's no longer about how worthy he sees himself of determining 
who should be his neighbor, judging who should be his neighbor, but how he sees others as worthy of his compassion and mercy. This is that change in thinking, that repentance that Jesus is requiring. And so Jesus closes this challenge out with the final call to action. Go and do just as the Samaritan. And this is what the scribe had originally asked about, what he had to do to gain eternal life. And, and as we've seen in other places, when Jesus uses this present tense, go and do, he's expressing a lifestyle of continuous action, not go and do once, go continually and do continually this, this lifestyle of being neighborly. So, and that's what the expert in the law has to do. He must now become an expert in practicing the law of loving one's neighbor by becoming the neighbor to all who need his compassion. It's not about who his neighbor is. It's him being the neighbor to everyone. And that's the point of the story. And that's where Luke ends that story. And then he continues with a second story. And this short story, like the encounter before it, is presented really without any kind of chronological or geographical order. Somewhere along the journey to Jerusalem, um, Jesus is invited to enjoy the hospitality at the home of Martha and Mary, which is what we read in Luke 10 verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the same pair of sisters who were introduced in John 11 as the siblings of Lazarus, whom Jesus raises to life. Although Luke doesn't note the location of the village where they live, John tells us that they live in Bethany, which is a village up on the Mount of Olives, just a couple of miles from Jerusalem. This Mary is the same woman who prepares Jesus's body for burial by anointing him with her expensive perfume. And she does this right before he enters Jerusalem for the Passover week, which we read in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, and we're going to cover again in John 12. So my guess, and it's just a guess, is that this is the first encounter with Mary and Martha, which will be followed by Jesus returning to raise Lazarus in John 11, followed by Mary's anointing in Matthew, Mark, and John. Because John presents Jesus going to Jerusalem for multiple festival, festivals over the length of his ministry, this encounter could have taken place during one of those pilgrimages, including the Feast of Tabernacles, which we find in John 7, or the Feast of Dedication in John 8. And I think that the story is placed here because it, it continues with these themes of discipleship and actionable love. And Luke makes it clear that Martha is the mistress of the house, since she is the one who opens her home to Jesus. And, and her name in Aramaic, it actually is um, the, the feminine form of mistress or master. So, so her name really is the mistress of the house. Um, so I think that's kind of fun. Um, and if this encounter is actually taking place during a, a pilgrim festival, then Lazarus, her brother, may be in Jerusalem at this time, along with Simon the leper. And and this is this is just a wondering, but something I was thinking about. I, I went down a little thinking trail, and and I wonder if Simon the leper, um, who I suggested might have been their father when we talked about this in Mark, he might also be the husband of either Martha or Mary. Again, I, I'm just thinking out loud here. But in any case, it, this is Martha's privilege to host Jesus. And according to rabbinical writings, uh, Bethany was, was widely celebrated as a destination for pilgrims because the people there were known for being really good hosts, right? Their hospitality was renowned. And so we have that as, a, as an added pressure on Martha. In addition, rabbis considered hospitality to be really important, and they actually compared it to receiving God's glory cloud in, in, in importance. So you, when you gave hospitality, it was if you, you were um, there or present 
and and honoring uh, the Shekinah glory of God. I mean, that's they considered it equal in importance. So you might imagine the pressure that Martha feels right now in welcoming Jesus himself into her home. And, and Martha's sister Mary is also present, and she chooses to sit and listen to Jesus, which means that her actions are completely aligned with that of a disciple. And, and disciples of rabbis were uh, uh, said to, ha- to sit at the rabbi's feet in order to drink in their knowledge and wisdom of scripture. And we've already seen where the former sinner, you know, she falls at Jesus's feet at an earlier banquet for Jesus in Luke 7 verse 38. And we've seen Jairus falling at Jesus's feet in Luke 8 verse 41. So sitting at Jesus's feet also has this additional connotation of faith, especially since Luke indicates that Mary sits at the Lord's feet. And Mary also is sitting uh, quietly listening to Jesus. And, and Paul tells us that, that, that faith comes by hearing, right? And, and he tells us this in, in Romans 10, 17, of course, that so, so she's actually gaining faith right now by listening to Jesus. And so uh, Jesus um, has presented earlier also that, that hearing is the correct response to God's revelation. So What's happening here is that we see where where Mary, by sitting at the feet of Jesus, is sitting as a disciple. She is is gaining faith, and and Jesus is seeing this as the correct response to to God's revelation of, of him bringing salvation through Jesus. And you know, the Greek actually indicates that Mary is not merely hearing Jesus's words, she's actually absorbing them. And so what Mary is doing is she's actually following God's command that he gave to Peter, James, and John in Luke 9, verse 35. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. So from a disciple's uh, perspective or an expectation for disciples, she's doing what she should be doing. But from a social expectation, what she's doing is highly unusual. Because women usually did not engage with men who were not related to them, even while they were hosting these men in their homes. So what would happen is that the women would be present and they would be present to serve and wait on the men who were there. And then after they had served the men, they made themselves scarce. Now, Jesus is an esteemed guest. And so they were, uh, of course, permitted to to listen to Jesus, listen to these esteemed guests. But they often did it inconspicuously from another room or along the wall. And this is what we saw or what we expected to see at the banquet that I was just mentioning earlier in Luke 7. Mary's not doing what's expected of her, and that causes Martha to complain. In contrast to Mary, Martha is busy preparing the meal. And Martha is flustered by all that she believes she has to do to properly host Jesus. And all that she sees is that Mary is relaxing at Jesus' feet, doing nothing helpful. Now, rather than go to Mary directly and discreetly confront her for not assisting Martha in the kitchen, Martha instead complains to Jesus. Let's go ahead and look at verse 40 again. But Martha was being distracted with much service. And having stood near, she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister left me to be serving alone? Tell her then that she should help me. There are several key words here that stand out. First, that Martha is distracted with much service. Recall that Jesus rejected any distractions from following him, which is what we saw with the three would-be disciples in Luke 9. Here, the service to Jesus has become a distraction from being with Jesus. Her preparations or her acts are actually preventing her from listening to Jesus, which we've just learned is the foundation of her faith. So what she is doing is acting as a barrier to her getting rooted in faith. Okay, so that's one thing. Did you also notice that that Martha addressed Jesus as Lord? I mean, that's correct. She should. But then what immediately followed that, right? She immediately tells him what to do. Jesus is Lord. He tells his disciples what they must do, not the other way around. Contrast this with Mary who says nothing to Jesus, but quietly submits to Jesus, sitting at his feet, absorbing everything that he says. Mary does treat Jesus as Lord, and in the process is demonstrating 
what it means to love Jesus. Third, I think we have this issue where Martha's emphasis is, is really on herself. She accuses Jesus of not caring that Mary has left her alone. Um, and she tells him to tell Mary to help her. And so I think like the expert in the law before her, Martha is considering herself as, as worthy to determine what should be done and with whom. And, and this is a bit of a faux pas, okay? So the Near Eastern ethics of hospitality, they, they, they still teach today that, that the host should only consider the guest needs. So despite herself in trying to be the hostess with the mostest, Martha is actually breaking a cultural norm regarding hospitality. I don't think she means to, but that is actually what's happening because she's thinking only of herself. Now, even though Martha accuses Jesus about not caring about her, he does care, which is what we see in Luke 10 verses 41 to 42. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Jesus is tender here. You know, he's trying to calm her down. He understands that she is overwhelmed, and, that, and that's really because she's focusing on serving Jesus rather than on Jesus himself. And, and really what we have to understand here is that Martha hasn't done anything wrong in wanting to serve Jesus. I think a number of commentaries get that wrong. There's nothing wrong with wanting to serve Jesus. Because serving is, in fact, a demonstration of love, which is what Jesus presented in that previous story, in the parable. The issue is that Martha has made the service what's important to her to the point of distraction. Because her priorities are wrong, it's resulted in anxiety and worry. And, you know, Martha has also judged Mary's expression of love for Jesus. Recall in Luke 6, verse 41 to 42, what Jesus says about judging another believer. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Martha's distraction and her frustration uh, are really of greater consequence to her faith than Mary's choice not to prepare a meal for Jesus. Martha's distraction is the plank in her own eye, which prevents her from seeing Mary's choice to sit at Jesus' feet as Jesus sees it. She's been blinded to how Jesus would see it. So in a reversal, Jesus actually judges Martha revealing that Mary has chosen better, has correctly prioritized listening to Jesus because her choice results in better understanding God's will, which then allows her for even more revelation, which is what Jesus told his disciples in Luke 8, verse 18. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. I think that this verse ties in very well with Jesus' statement about Mary's choice, that it will not be taken from her. By choosing not to listen, on the other hand, Martha is in great danger of losing the revelation she already has about Jesus. It's kind of wild how that applies to them. Now, we might also see this as a confirmation that when we start by listening to Jesus, when we start with listening, we understand what we then must go and do. We don't start with the do, we start with listening. And you know, Jesus' words are interesting here. One thing is needed. I think that that's meant to tie in with the original question that the expert in the law asked Jesus. What must he do to gain eternal life? Now, only one thing is needed to do. To gain eternal life, a person starts by hearing the word of God. Hearing comes before doing, so that one acts from having heard what to do. Mary made the right choice, despite social expectations, to help Martha in the kitchen. And you know what? The Samaritan, he also made the right choice, despite social expectations, that he act to the contrary. So we see here this wonderful uh, rebuke or dismissal of uh, not listening to what society says, instead only listening to Jesus. Just another application. 
Do you notice how, how how Luke keeps doing that? How he keeps referencing back and revealing what Jesus has already said. He, it's it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I think it might be my favorite part about Luke. Okay, so Jesus calls this right choice the good portion in the in the original Greek. It's called the good portion, which in reference to Martha's food preparations, I think figuratively means that Mary has chosen the right meal to prepare. And and we do have plenty of reference to portion as a description of food. Like Joseph, going back to him, him giving Benjamin five extra portions of food to show his favor, which you can read in Genesis 43, 34, or the portions of food offerings for the priests and the Levites that we, of course, find in Leviticus. But what I don't think is happening, I don't think that Jesus means that Mary has chosen spiritual food here, even though Jesus does call himself the bread of life in John 6, 35, or how Jesus tells his disciples in John 4.34 that his food is to do the will of the Father and accomplish his work. Because I think what Jesus actually is referring to here is, is a other scripture, because we do have scripture that calls God the essential portion, like Asaph does in Psalm 73.26, and David in Psalm 16.5, and Psalm 119.57. And actually, I want to dig in a little more to Psalm 16, verse 5, because it's really interesting. I think it, more than any of the other scriptures that talk about God as, as our portion, really does connect back to this original question of inheriting eternal life. Let's go ahead and look at Psalm 16. We're going to read verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed. I have a beautiful inheritance. Mary choosing the good portion, listening to Jesus, leads to a beautiful inheritance, eternal life in God's kingdom. And rabbis often, um, well, at least they had uh, also referenced inheritance as the good portion. Uh, the way that they use this is when it came time for orphans to divide their family estate, the court would appoint guardians who would select the good portion for each of the orphans. So I think we could use that here that by submitting to Jesus, he guards our inheritance in the Father's kingdom and selects or chooses for us all that we need. He selects for us our good portion. And, you know, I think on an even deeper level, and, and I've implied this throughout, this is really about love, right? The Good Samaritan shows disciples how to love others as they love themselves. Fundamentally, that is shown through denying themselves and doing whatever they can to show compassion and mercy to those in need. This short story, it shows disciples how to love Jesus. And that comes by prioritizing listening to him, which is what God commanded us to do. Disciples love Jesus by allowing him to interpret God's word and doing as Jesus has said. So in today's readings, we've seen how Jesus interprets the great commandment, loving God with everything we have and loving uh, our neighbors, who's everyone, right, uh, as we love ourselves, right? And so we see here this first instance of how Jesus is interpreting um what the expert in the law had interpreted, he's reinterpreting it this for his disciples, and it's all about love. And that's all of chapter 10, and that's really all of our time today. Um, when we pick up next time, we're, we're going to be in Luke 11, which is where Jesus is going to continue to interpret for his disciples what it means to love God. So I can't wait to do that with you. Um, and uh, I, I, if you've read ahead and if you're familiar with Matthew, this is, this is not the first time that we've heard what it means to love God and how we demonstrate that because it's, it's primarily in relationship, which comes in prayer. So that's all for today, my friends. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I hope as always that, that this was edifying to you and encouraged you and taught you a new dimension of God's love for you and how we are meant to share that love with a lost and dying world, with other believers and with those who, who are perishing. And it's, it's our privilege to be able to present this to them. Know that I, I love you and that I'm praying for you. I pray that God uh, watch over you and protect you, that his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, that he, he, he protect you in all your ways, that he send angels to guard you as you go forth and do what he's called you to do. Take care, my friends. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.